doesn't matter where you're from in the world. It's not okay to make an excuse. I only started training because I, I loved it. If you pick up that weight more than me, you're stronger than me. I'm the oldest of five siblings. My dad's one of my biggest role models. These guys have got so much more than I ever will have, and they're so much stronger. And if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna do it. Our mum passed, passing away. When, when you're watching someone, So guys, my name's Luke Stoltman, I'm 35 years old, I'm a professional strongman. Where, whereabouts have you got? Whereabouts have you got? So I've, I've grown up all my life in uh, a town called, very small town called Invergordon in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, I was born in Inverness, which we call the capital of the Highlands, you know, it's a very small city. Um, and yeah, I grew up in the, in the town here, just in the outskirts of town. Um, more country, I guess, than, than town. Um, but yeah, it's been an awesome place to grow up, great childhood. Um, couldn't ask for a better place to grow up, I don't think. Um, just, just for people who don't know, um, like we're, we're far up north, it's, it is, it is a town. Like explain sort of in Gordon to people who, who've never lived in a city their whole life. Yeah, so, so we, we have quite a lot of people coming up and stuff, you know, like, like yourselves coming up. And um, so when people drive up from England, they all, 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 always kind of think of like Glasgow and Edinburgh as Scotland. Everything's near Glasgow and Edinburgh. So you get to Glasgow, Invergordon's another kind of four hours further north of Glasgow. So it's it's not the furthest point up north, but it's um, certainly, yeah, it's pretty, pretty far up. I mean, from Manchester to Invergordon, seven hours maybe eight hours um so for like tom and i growing up here we didn't have a lot of stuff you know there wasn't um certainly starting strongman it wasn't an easy road you know there wasn't any well-equipped gyms there wasn't any kind of atlas stones log presses to use we had to really um kind of improvise on what we used for uh, strength equipment um and i think that's why we kind of are very proud of what we've done up here. You know, we're opening a gym, we're kind of pushing the, pushing strongman to the forefront in, in Scotland. And I, I truly believe that's a, a kind of reaction to how well Tom and I have done. Um, so yeah, it's pretty far north. It's, it's We say it's in the arse end of nowhere. That's, that's basically what we say, yeah. So it's, but it's a cool place to be. You know, it's, you walk down the high street, you go shopping and everyone seems to know you. Yeah, it's a nice, you know, when we did well in World's Strongest Man last year, you'd go to the supermarket, all the old wifeys, the, the kids coming up to you saying, you know, how proud they were. And, you know, it's such a nice kind of, it's, it's a nice way of being very humbled. You know, even though you're doing well, you're successful, you come back and, you know, old Margaret from down the road, she's like, I remember when you were a little boy, you, were, you weren't that big, son, I tell you. So it's, it's quite nice, you know, it's, it's very, um, homely, it's a homely feeling. Um, I, I mean, I, I definitely agree, like being here, it's been, it's cool been a good area. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so for people, people again, like in, in the city, like what's the, the way of life like around here? Yeah, so in the Highlands, we're very, um, everything's done at a slower pace, I would say. It's very, I was saying to you earlier on, you know, it's like if we're caught in traffic for, anything over a minute, it's it's a big deal for us up here. Um, it's it's a nice, friendly way of life. I think we're quite a friendly bunch up here. Where, um, I'd like to think, certainly Tom, myself, anyone, our family are very welcoming of anyone that comes up here. And um, because it's so far away, that's when people come up to visit, you know, it's, it's nice that they've made that effort. So for us, like you guys coming up, it's such a long drive. So we want to be able to kind of show you stuff, do things with you and kind of accommodate you as well as we can. And um, I think that Highland um, hospitality is, is quite well renowned throughout the world. Um, you know, cross that with a couple of whiskeys, you know, a bit of haggis and stuff, you know, it's quite a nice um, welcoming to a lot of people. And, and again, I touched on it, the, the kind of local people, our kind of people that we've grown up with, um, you know, that's why Tom and I do what we do to a certain point as well. It's to try and put Invergordon on the map. You know, it's the Highlands of Scotland. I've, 
I've spoke about it kind of numerous times about the, the Highland warrior aspect. You know, that's when I started kind of doing strongman and strength, that's what, you know, I envisioned myself to be. It's like almost like a modern day kind of Highland warrior, as kind of cheesy as that sounds. But, you know, we've all seen Braveheart and seen like the, the guys and, and the kind of clans when they, wearing the kilts with the big claymores. You know, that's basically what Tom and I are doing now. You know, we're going to battle with the strongest men in the world and, and that's what we want to do. We want to show Scotland for what it is. It's a strong nation full of strong men and, and that's what it's been historically, you know, it's it's not a nation of like weak, kind of soft men. It's like we've come from it's a hard environment up here. It's like the weather's pretty you know, it's nineteen, twenty degrees here and that's cracking, you know, we're sweating here, but you know, in the winter time the winds are bad, you know, we get bad snow, bad like, bad rain, it's it's not the most um, homely of uh, environments to be from, you know, so, but again, it's this is what we're used to, it's, people will see it, we do our cold therapy, you know, when we go out into these lochs, into the rivers in the winter time, it is really that cold, you know, when we're saying it's freezing, it's like, one, two, three degrees, whatever, and it is, it's Baltic, it's so cold, so it's, um, it's, it's not the easiest place to be from, but a lot of people kind of use that as an excuse not to succeed, um, so it's, you know, we're in the Highlands, it's so far away from Glasgow, Edinburgh, all these big cities, um, and what I would like to show people is that it doesn't matter where you're from in the world, you could be from some tribe in Africa or, you know, the Highlands of Scotland from a little island on the West Coast. It doesn't matter where you're from. It's really about how much you want to succeed in something. And I think being successful should never, or be, wanting to be successful, you shouldn't have any of these excuses. You know, it's a, a town is just a town. You know, you're, you're your own person. So you've really got to kind of put in that effort and put in that hard work, you know, regardless where you're from. Yeah, I mean, we, like we were speaking about today, um, I can't remember your, your friend's name who started his own gym and um, he created all his gym equipment and everything. Could you expand more on that? Um, it was in, uh, was it Iron Bibby? Oh, Iron Bibby, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah I mean, p yeah, Iron Bibby, probably the strongest soldiers in the world. You know, he's in Burkina Faso, I believe, in Africa. I thought it was a made-up country when I first met him. Um, and Bibby, you know, he's, he's, it's, it's not the, you know, you know, it's not like being in the UK or America that like weights are on hand, you know, so Iron Bibby's kind of made his equipment, kind of, he's having to fill his log with sand to kind of make the weight up and stuff, so, and now he's one of the most, like, well-renowned kind of strongmen in the world, you know, he's, he's really kind of pushed himself on and he hasn't used that you know, I'm from, you know, the middle of Africa or whatever it is, as an excuse. So it's it's like people like that kind of really, I guess, kind of inspire me. It's, they don't make any excuses. I hate, like for me, making excuses is just another reason um, why you're not going to succeed. You know, it's, it's not, it's not a valid reason unless you can't physically enable yourself to train, i.e. you've got you know, even having no legs, no arms, you know, we've seen all these wonderful stories of people, not wonderful, but they've, they've gone through trauma and they've kind of overcome that and they're very successful in what they do. So I just don't, I wouldn't say I don't like it, I just don't agree with people making excuses because it's, we're, we're from a, a society now, I think, that an excuse is okay. You know, we've accepted it, right? Let's make an excuse why we can't do it. It's not okay to make an excuse because, you know, I've got not enough time. I've not, there's not enough hours in the day to this. I don't like this food. I don't like this. It's, we shouldn't be saying that's okay to make those type of excuses. It's, let's not make the excuses. Let's kind of man up and kind of just move on and get on and, and do better for ourselves. And I think that's what Iron Bibby's done tenfold. You know, he's just really kind of pushed the, pushed the bar um, and then, I mean, you meet him in person, he's phew, ah, phenomenal. Uh, they must feed him well over in Africa, I tell you, he's a big old lamp guy. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, we were, again, we were speaking about it earlier, about um, when you first started out, because mm. obviously you, you've, been in, you've been in this a lot longer than, than Tom as well. Yeah. 
and uh, when you first started out, there wasn't that much access to strong, well, there weren't access to gyms around there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. So, you, you, I mean, in terms of excuses, you've got, you've got 100, you could yeah, do yeah. you didn't, which is amazing. Yeah, and, uh, So, uh, how did you personally overcome all those, those shortfalls of where you was, you was growing up at the time to do strong man? Uh, I mean, for me, I only started training because I, I loved it. You know, when I was 16, I went into the local gym, which is five minutes away. Um, I don't think you're allowed to deadlift there now because it's on a first floor and it damages the flooring. So um, that's one of those things. But for me, kind of evolving my journey and, and strength, you know, it wasn't ever a, a reason not to get stronger. You know, I had a bar and I had some weight, so I could always deadlift. I could always squat, I could always overhead press, bench press. Um, we kind of improvised a little bit with regards to, so a log press, we only had a Swiss bar, which, you know, it's got uh, bars going the other, uh, rather than doing your barbell press, it has the bars going kind of long ways, whatever you want to call it, to mimic the log press. So it was, um, it was interesting doing that. Uh, you know, you go, I'm going into my first competition, I hadn't touched a log press, there was a giant dumbbell, never touched that, never done stones, never did yoke, you know, I didn't do anything, but for me it wasn't like, I wasn't worried about it, you know, I thought, well, I'm just picking up something, surely I'm not that much of an idiot that I can't work out how to pick up something and carry it or, you know, do whatever. Thankfully it went okay for me and I ended up winning that competition, but um, it took quite a lot of years to to build up that equipment and kind of invest in, in myself as, or in ourselves. Um, obviously I started a little bit earlier than Tom, so there was a lot of stuff that we'd bought. So we bought stones, we bought log press, a deadlift bar, you know, all these things we kind of financed ourselves. Um, and we still use them now, in, you know, now today in the gym, it's just amazing. So 10 years ago I bought it and it still just shows the, the quality of it, um, that if you buy good, then it'll last for a while. But it wasn't anything, I never thought I was hard done by, you know, when I'm going up against guys that's got a full array of strongman equipment, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's at the end of the day, you're either stronger than me or not, I'm not going to make an excuse because, well, I didn't have a log press, I didn't have a stone, I didn't have this, you're stronger than me because you've, you're stronger than me, it's, it's, that's the beauty with strength, I think, if, um, if you go up against someone, mano a mano, kind of, you know, pick up the same weight. If you pick up that weight more than me, you're stronger than me. It's simple, it's not rocket science. So, um, and again, yeah, I've never tried to make any excuses. And if I do rubbish in a show, I kind of mess up. It's not, I've got to hold myself accountable. There's not any reason, you know, it's not the referee's fault. It's not my coaches, the nutritionist. It's, it's down to me. If I haven't kind of lived up to my end of the bargain, then that's the reason why I've kind of not performed fully and I think a lot of people should try and hold themselves a bit more accountable. I think um, self-improvement and self-worth, you'd feel so much better if you just kind of held yourself accountable a lot more in life. Definitely, mm. definitely. Accountability is one of the most important things. I think, like I say, if, you, uh, if people escape it. Yeah, 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 yeah. With excuses. Mm -hmm. with excuses. Um, just, just Going back um, to early days, childhood, mm. um, big, big family. Yeah, so I'm the oldest of five siblings. Um, you had a great kind of childhood, man. It was, it, I mean, being in the, in the Highlands again, it's like, pfft, we used to go out making dens, swimming in rivers, jumping in lochs. It was such a, a nice kind of childhood for me. I, I've got nothing but kind of, you know, great memories of kind of back in the summer, I used to go out on my bike, cycle, oh, everywhere. That's all we used to do, is cycle around. I used to be really into my football. Um, I kind of took that up till I was kind of 15, 16. Um, didn't, academically, I wasn't stupid, but that authority thing didn't really work well with me with the teacher aspect of it. Um, I just found it hard to give someone respect that I, didn't know, you know, just because you're a teacher shouldn't mean that I should respect you. That's what I, I struggled a little bit with. So I didn't really last that long <laughs> for, for a few other reasons. Um, 
And then, yeah, just kind of got into the gym, I think, when I was 16. But childhood-wise, man, it was just... I just remember, like, days being sunny, me out in the, in the summertime just running around, chilling, um, and then, you know, kind of cut, kind of... Tom's 10 years younger than me. We've got a younger brother, Harry. He's 11 years younger, so... When I was kind of 10, Tom and Harry came on the scene. Um, that was that was pretty tough, you know. Growing up with Tom, Tom has his issues, and I'm sure you'll talk about. Um, but it was it was tough, kind of, you know, seeing seeing one of your family members going through that, you know, and not knowing really what to do or the right things to do. Um, but you know, with with my mum, how good she was with Tom and how good she was with us. I mean. Our dad, he, he was working in oil and gas as well, so he was like such a, he is such a hard working man. I mean, he kind of, I think he probably installed that kind of work ethic into us. Um, I mean, he was away for months at a time and poor mum was left to look after all five of us, kind of, I was out drinking, causing a, you know, crashing dad's van or whatever, you know, and she had to deal with all that. She was like the mother and the father, so. Um, when Dad came back, he was always a kind of good guy, kind of, oh, Dad, any chance to get a new pair of trainers? And he'd take me up, you know, we'd go and buy trainers and stuff. But um, it was just a very fortunate, I think, how, how we were raised. And, and seeing those, having your role models, you know, so close to you. So even today, like my dad's one of my biggest role models. It's um, for him to raise and provide as well as he's done over those years. Um, such a, you know, a big family and, and for us all to be so close now is, is something I think of a, it's a huge achievement. It's, I don't know, it's, if, if we win World's Strongest Man, I'd still think Dad's, what Dad's done is a bigger achievement than that because it's, it takes so much time, so much effort, the kind of carry-ons I've caused, you know, stress and stuff through, you know, just being young, out drinking, not coming home for days on end, just, been a daft twat, you know, and, and that's all it was, just being an idiot back then and not really seeing the kind of damage that you could be causing. So um, it was, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty lucky to be kind of brought up as we have been, I think. Yeah, I think, but I do think it shows, like you were saying earlier, um, with Cork there, and I feel like you've welcomed her. You take nice, man, her I appreciate you, it, like, yeah. Look after her, it's been nice. Yeah. And it's like, it's just, I mean, that's more, more, more towards your dad as well, like, raising you that way, with yeah. your whole family. Mm. Um, I, want, I do want to talk about uh, Tom, yeah. like, grow, like growing up with him, but um, uh, just briefly, whilst we're talking about, like, your dad working on a race, yeah, yeah. I mean, you spoke to us about it, like, are you, um, did you, know that you were going to follow your dad's footsteps onto the ribs or is that something that happened in Inverbordon? Um, it was a tricky one, you know, because, like I said, I wasn't, I, like, I wasn't stupid in school. I was quite actually okay. Um, but just the authority thing I couldn't get, get round with, so I kind of left. Did a bit of college work when I was 16, working in the fish factory. And back then, it was a bit more easy to get into the, the oil and gas side of things. So dad like for my 18th birthday so you need a an offshore survival course you have to go and do all this jumping out of a helicopter and all this jazz nothing nothing fancy so anyway he got me that and that enabled me to go offshore um but growing up i never thought i was going to be on an oil rig jesus i didn't it's not something you exactly dream about oh i want to go away and be two three weeks away with other sweaty horrible men sharing a bunk bed they're sharing uh, a room with a couple of sweaty men, it's not, if that's your idea for a good time and fair, fair play, but for me it's it's just not, it wasn't something that I envisioned myself to do. Um, but it was up here in Scotland, the oil and gas is so prominent, you know, it's such a, but again, when I was younger, it was quite an easy job to get into, if you knew someone that could kind of vouch for you and stuff. and. Luckily, Dad kind of vouched for me and he got me in with his company and then it was up to me to, you know, progress and, and kind of climb that ladder, so to speak. And uh, yeah, I did that for 16 years and it was, a, yeah, it was a huge part of my life, you know, but it's thankfully that's done now. You know, it's, um, I would, it's a tough one. I wouldn't say I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but it's not a, 
it's a very kind of it can be a very damaging way of life, you know, especially with a family or a wife or you know, it's if you're a single guy, you know, fire and go for it, make your money and do whatever. But you know, it's it's tough when you're when you're married and you're trying to have that kind of relationship with someone, you're still getting to know each other as well, you know, you're still kind of growing together. So I found when I went away, my kind of mentality or my mental health really took a battering. It was, you're almost getting prepared to kind of go to war almost. It was, and my wife Cushy really noticed that, you know, it was like took three, four days before I went off. It was pretty much ruined because I was getting into that zone and kind of thinking, it was almost like a resentment I had to go away and, you know, all my friends were at home and my wife was at home and stuff and um, it's it's tough, it's, it is a really tough way of life being away for so long um, and you really need to have someone that you, you, you trust 100%. I've seen so many guys, such a shame when you're offshore, you know, their wives or girlfriends are doing whatever, you know, some other guys and stuff and um, Thankfully, rightly or wrongly, I trust Cushy 100%, and that that trust that you have for your partner is so important when you're in that type of environment because, oh, it's, it's awful. They just self destruct when they're out there, and sometimes you have to get the, the, the helicopters to come in from the oil rig and go home. And it's it's such a it can be such a toxic place to be when your when your mental health isn't that great. Yeah, it's it's um it's tough, man, but. Hopefully, touch wood, I won't have to be going back off again anytime soon. So, I mean, mixing to that, that you start, you've, been, you've been doing strongman for a while, while she's on the river as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, true. So what's, I mean, that's a like, concoction for... Yeah. Like, things, man. Uh, so, so, I remember, so my, my first trip offshore when I was 18, um, I thought, you know, I, I did the gym before when I was 16, kind of just in for chest and whatever. So offshore, when you're there, you've got, there's a TV room and there's a gym in the majority of rigs you go to. So I was like, well, I could either sit around, eat sweets, get fat and watch TV, or I could try and go to the gym. So I thought, right, stuff it. Very first gym I went to offshore, <laughs> it's actually a boy from Invergordon, uh, I went down to the gym and this grown man was running in his wife fronts, his pants, on the treadmill. I'm like, for fuck's sake, this is, this is, this isn't for me, like, I don't know why he was running his pants, for one. So, right, fine, just don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact, it'll be fine. Um, and just started training, and then that really helped the mentality, my mindset kind of cope with things, because you're seeing progress. You know, every day is Groundhog Day, pretty much, when you're out in the rigs, but if you can see that progress in the gym and stuff, you can almost take comfort in things, or moving forward, and there's, it's a weird thing, I don't know, a weird outlook I had on it. It just helped me kind of focus on something that was getting better. It was making me kind of a better person, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, some of the rigs you go to, there was a treadmill and that's all you could do. So yeah, OK, I'll try and do 10K a day or whatever, you know, just change however you can. Um, but it, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was tough to compete with. <sighs> You know, I was doing three weeks a month, kind of, and there's a lot of guys that I'm going up against that are working and living and breathing, doing the gym, doing strongman, and that was a tough thing. And I, I kind of, I think back then when I was when I was doing it full time like that, it was um, I always doubted myself going in a competition. I thought to myself, you know, it's like these guys have got so much more than I ever will have, and they're so much stronger and. Um, and then it just takes that kind of, it's almost a flip, you know, a, a switch went off my head. I'm like, I'm beating some of these guys while I've just done three weeks, I've just come out to a competition, I'm beating them, and these are full time. I thought, geez, imagine that. And it was actually um, Colin Bryce, the director of Giants Live, that said to me, he says, he says, look, you carry on doing this, you know, part time, part time uh, training, part time results full-time training, full-time results. And that really stuck with me, you know, that really, I thought, yeah, you know, it's, he's been about a bit and he knows what he's talking about. So I thought, I think it was the last year, finishing second in one of the shows, I thought, mm, imagine, I wonder where I can get to, 
um, and I just made the decision just to stop. I says, right, that's it. I'm, I'm done offshore. You know, I owe it to myself. I don't want to be one of those guys in 15 years in the pub saying, oh, well, I could have done that. I could have done this. I could have done that. I would hate myself if I turned into one of those people that they could have, you know, I could have, should have done it. It's not something who I am. I've not been brought up like that. I've been brought up to, you know, put in the work and get the rewards. That's, that's how I see myself. So for me, it was, it was taking a big chance, you know, because offshore is quite well paid. Um, and it was like, you know what, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. So we took that risk. And, well, we've only had one competition this year, so <laughs> I don't know how it's paying off. <laughs> so hopefully, come the competitions, when they do come, you know, everything will be all gung-ho, we'll be, you know, really ready to kind of kick some ass when we go out to these big comps. That's, that's the plan anyway. Um, I mean, even outside of, of Strongman, there's a, a lot of people who are on the edge of making that same decision mm. or, or struggling to make that same decision for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, looking back uh, with, now, with the perspective you've got yeah. now, what would you say to those people? I, I just don't think about it, just do it, you know, it's, if you find your passion in anything, you know, it could be baking, it could be drawing, writing, whatever, it's, find that passion and just don't let it go, um, don't have that plan B, you know, um, that's what I had for so long, so strong man, it was just, it was just a hobby, you know, even though we were making some money and we're, it was growing and stuff, it was just a, a hobby, so I thought, well, you know, I'll do the offshore thing. I'll maybe do a bit more of the strongman, but I always have that plan B to go back in the rigs. So now I'm I'm done. There's no no plan B, C, D. It's only one thing, and that's strongman, and that's improving myself and the brand, the Stoltman brand. You know, to be a worldwide brand and to you know really cement my feet and the kind of the foundations of strength across the world. That's my plan. Um, and if it doesn't work, I don't know what's going to happen. But I'm not thinking that, I'm thinking it's got to work. You know, I don't have, I've got a wife to support, I've got a house to pay for, I've got, you know, our dad, he's kind of retired now, so looking after him as much as we can, I want to be able to financially support him and just let him live his retirement because he's done so much to us. Um, so it'd be nothing better for me, you know, to be able to go out to, I don't know, whatever, buy him a new pickup. You know, imagine, you know, if I was, uh, if my son did that to me and, and financially could afford to do that, I'd be so proud. Um, so that's what I want to be able to do is, is make this work, not only just for me, but, you know, to show other people around here, uh, around the Highlands, that it's a possibility. It's not, not to, you get all these naysayers saying, no, you can't do that. It's not a good idea, blah, blah, you're, you're in a secure job. That's fine, but that secure job, you had to start somewhere with it. You know, so take that chance and think, right, don't, don't throw it away by being in something that you hate doing. You know, it's, it's and I think our mum passed, passing away, that really kind of installed that kind of thinking. It's like, your life is just so fragile. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so treat each day like it's your last day, and, and that's what I've been doing, I think, for the last, last little while, and it's, it's, you enjoy life a lot more doing it that way, I think. So yeah, um, I think you said you won't pass two years, is that right? Yeah, uh, it was before years November now. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. did that coincide with when you made the decision to come off the, the ring and stuff like that? Is it what motivated it? Um, it, it was a tough one because mum was always like, so you better get back to work, you know, work, work, work. And, uh, <laughs> so like mum passed away and a week after I was back offshore. Um, and that was to kind of honour her, like she wouldn't like me kind of, <laughs> like moping around feeling sorry for myself you know so but what I've, I've done since mum's passed is really it's like a lot of people we all talk about fucking pain like oh, I'm in pain I'm in and it gets me so like I say it to myself and I, I get annoyed at myself because when when you're watching someone So like with mum with her or cancer, you know, you're watching her 
someone that's like the, the epitome of everything. Um, go through that much pain, that's like, that's pain. Not fucking squatting, not, I've got sore knees, that's not pain, man. She's, it's, it's, she, she had to get this big fucking injection to stop her from like, being paralysed. Um, I remember her saying, oh, that was, that was quite sore. So, like, for someone like that to say that's quite sore, you know it's really sore. Um, so, like, that, that's what I kind of translate now. If, if my, like, the, three days before she passed away, I went, I went to see her and uh, she was in a pretty bad way then. And she was <laughs> making cakes with this bucket list. She was trying to make these, uh, I've still got them in the freezer, these pear tarts. <laughs> and she was breaking the eggs but she was putting the yolks or the, the eggs in the bin and putting the shells in the mixer, you know, so she was like completely gone. I said, come on, man, let's go and have a wee chat and, and just chill and stuff. And like, I looked down and her feet are swollen and, and she's just in agony, man. And I think, fucking hell, man, if we can't get through a little couple of training sessions to make us better, I mean, that's, for me, that's what I took really to heart. You know, it's like, I don't want to moan about being sore and, you know, because it's just superficial, that pain is not real. Once you, you know, you go through something like that, um, emotionally, uh, we've been through pain because you're watching someone just kind of deteriorate so much. And it's such a horrible thing to do, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that same pain, man. It's, it's such a horrible thing to do and go through, but, but taking the positives out of it, she inspired me no end to, like, push through that whatever limit that I thought I had, I'm just pushing through and breaking through. And that's one of the reasons it was like thinking about mum, what mum, you know, would want for me. You know, would she want me to be in a job where I can make decent money, but not be happy, not really fulfill my passion in life? Or would she want me to take a chance and go out and go get my passion? And that was a, that was a no brainer. She'd, you know, if someone loves you, you want, they want you to chase your pa passion. So. Um, you know, it's it's very true that no matter like people say that just because that person's dead or gone, they don't stop um, having that relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So, like I always have her in the the back of my head, like what would mum think? What would mum think? So, even though she's not here in person, um, her presence is still everywhere for me. You know, it's even even painting. I mean, Dad and I were down painting the the bit of the gym two years ago and it was nice, we were just painting. And then dad just broke down in tears, just saying, oh, your mum would be so, so happy to be down here doing this. You know, so it's things like that, that it's, it's, it's touching, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's never gonna go away. And I hope it's her memory's never gonna, you know, and it won't. It keeps influencing me to not be a, not be a complete dickhead, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I think um, I, I spoke to you a little bit before, like with like it's like grief, like especially when it's like a loss of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does give you like it, it's so strange. And I, think, I think it's something I've, I, I, you just portrayed so amazingly. People who are going through grief or struggling, mm. it does give you a, a different strength. Like it gives you this new outlook. Yeah. Strength, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, how was um, like your mental health when you're going through all that at that, at that point in time? It wasn't the best, you know, it was, my marriage really kind of took a bit of a hit from it. Um, I had a lot of resentment, you know, towards, and I don't think Kushi will mind me saying this because I've chatted about with her, um, towards her because she still had a family, you know, she still had her mum and dad. And, you know, going up for dinner with her parents was a struggle. Like, I couldn't physically bring myself to do that. so we'd normally have a fight before I'd go up and see her and I just, she'd go up by herself. Um, struggled a lot to talk about things. You know, it's now I'm very open and I don't mind showing my emotion and stuff because it's, it's healthy, I think. And um, to be honest, that's, it's, it's something that is such a massive thing that we, need, we all need to do is talk about stuff. But um, it's a struggle, you know, as a, as a man and as a, a big strong man, whatever you want to call it, it's tough to show kind of that um, other side. Uh, it's, you know, just kind of turning a blind eye and saying everything's okay and, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, it's not fine. You know, you've lost someone as important, like a, 
honestly, I can't even describe put words how important our mum was in our life. She was the the son, like she was as important as the son for us. Um, so losing someone like that, it's it's okay for it not to be okay. If that makes sense, you know, if you're having a bad time, you know, speak about it. And I actually went to therapy and um, talked about it with someone for quite a, a, a number of, well, a good couple of years. Um, I'm just trying to work out things that were going on. You know, it's it's tough. It's not. Because when I think when people see me, I'm quite happy and kind of, you know, one of the guys that kind of plays up to the crowd and everything like that. And it's, and that's how I am as a person. But on the other side, you know, you get the down days that, um, like, you just kind of knocks you out sometimes. And, and that's the days that you need that support, you know. So I'm so thankful that, you know, dad, brothers, sisters, my wife, so supportive. Um, and it's just learning how to, kind of communicate and, and kind of make sure that, you know, you're getting heard um, and you're not scared to be heard. And I think that's one of the most valuable things, certainly in, in the UK, you know, this, the suicide rates and stuff is just such a, a horrible thing to see people just crumble and quite a big advocate of like, being able to speak and, excuse me, trying to communicate with people that are struggling, you know, it's, because imagine being, not as fortunate as us to have that family, you know, not to have your brothers, your your dads, your your wife, you're by yourself, you've lost the only person that's that's there for you and you don't have anyone else. You know, that's the people that you've got to really <sighs> help out for. And as a you know, society and, and humans, we want to be able to help these people out and if if we can do if we can just help one person, you know, from doing anything silly or stupid, then you know, we're doing a good job. Um, and I, I implore anyone watching this or that know us just to get in touch and just reach out to us because we're honestly, <laughs> I'm always, always available for a chat for anything. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we, spoke, we spoke about this earlier about um, yesterday, about suicide rates, mental health, yeah. and especially among men. It's yeah, like, man. Terrible. And, uh, I, I'm kind of on the same thought process as you. Like a lot, a lot of it stems from like people just not willing to talk about their mm. feelings and emotions. I think it's really good for you to be able to talk about, it, especially being like one of the, the manliest men <laughs> yeah. in and be able to open up and talk is important. Yeah, it's, and I think it's it's more important now than ever before. Obviously, with all the the way the the world is at the moment, um, you know, with the lockdown, COVID, and everything else out there. You know, the whole everyone portraying a perfect life in social media. It's, it's okay not to have a perfect life. If someone says to me, you know, I never fight with anyone, I never have bad words with the wife or anything like that, then I'm like, well, that's not, that's almost not healthy. You know, you need to have that release. For me, someone said, like, sometimes with Kush and I, it's like you hate each other. And I said to them, I says, well, sometimes I do hate her. Like, with, with my wife Kushi, she makes me feel everything. You know, I love her, love her to death, hate her. She makes me emotional. You know, it's every aspect of every feeling I've ever had that she makes me feel, and that's why I know it's real. Um, so it's it's okay to be able to say, I'm having a bad day with the wife, I'm having a bad day with my family or whatever. It's it's fine, no one's, like I go into the supermarket and I sometimes have a panic, not a panic attack, feel anxious, and I hope, I hope no one's gonna come and speak to me and get all hot and sweaty and panic and, you know, it's okay to feel like that. It's not, you're not a freak to feel like that. It's just one of those things that, you know, you might be having a bad day, there might be something else in your head that's not um, healthy for you, but, you know, just just know that it's not, you're not alone. You know, everyone has his feelings and that's why everyone has his feelings. And we know that, we know there's a high suicide rate, suicide rate in, the, in men in the UK. So obviously other people are feeling the same as you. So go get help, go speak to someone, reach out to us, whatever, man. Just um, just don't be scared. I mean, you're not any less of a man for speaking about it. I mean, it's not, it's not a big thing to talk about something, ask for help. It's, it's in, in, in the opposite way, you know, you're probably more of a, 
more of a man, more of a stronger person, you know, coming forward and saying, look, I'm not okay, is there any way that we could help? And luckily, you know, for, for me, what I found helped massively is, is training, going to the gym, you know, releasing that kind of anxiety, that kind of bad feelings I had through the weights, and that really transgressed, and I'm just such a, a better person now because I can talk about it with people and because I can train so much. So, um, going, to, going to the gym, you like to, like to train by yourself? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, what's, what's going on in your head? You pick it like, got, got the heavy bars in front of you, yeah. you're about to leave it all out there. What's, what's that like in, inside your head? It's, it's almost like... So I was saying this earlier, so I like to come in and train by, by myself. It's like a meditation almost. You know, you're not really worried about anything. You know, it's like a release. It's like a... I don't know. It's, it's, you kind of leave all your problems away and just kind of come in and you're striving for that perfect lift. Do you know, it's like... It's almost like... So for me, with the log press, it's, everything's got to be so... The clean, the, the kind of the clean motion's got to be perfect. It's got to sit perfectly on your shoulders. You got to pop it perfectly. And there's so many elements that you know everything has to go right to make it happen. So sometimes I prefer to be in by myself because there's no distractions. There's no one else. It's just it's just me, you know. And it's something that I love to do. I get such a buzz from being in that gym by myself. When I have a good lift, phone up my wife. Yeah, smashed it. Did this. It's going to be a good night. Same, had a bad lift, all right, okay, it's going to be a shit night. You know, it, you kind of get the vibe from it. So it's um, just a way of, yeah, really releasing all that kind of energy, all that kind of, you know, if you've got any bad feelings, kind of anxiety or stuff, it's just almost like that kind of zen moment that you have before that lift. Like, you've put so much into it, and it is, it's so much kind of effort you've put into it, and it's, when it goes right, you're just so elated. It's like the best feeling. <laughs> you know, obviously people get addicted to drugs and stuff, but when you're hitting those lifts, I think that's probably the best feeling because it's only you that's doing it. You know, you don't, okay, you've got coaches, nutritionists and stuff, but only you can do that lift. And if you've done everything right and it's that perfect lift and you nail it, it's like, fuck, that's like, boom, that's my high. Like, that's my... Uh, all the endorphins and everything going and I'm just buzzing. It takes me so long to come down then because the adrenaline's going and like, I'll be up till three o'clock in the morning kind of buzzing and it's like just... Pff, think I'm getting tingles just fucking thinking about it now, man. It's, <laughs> it's good, man. It's such a good feeling, positive. Just such a an amazing kind of feeling to experience. So we're in a space that you've built Strongman, like, what does strongman mean to you? I mean, geez, strongman is life for me, man. It's, it's um, without, I said before, and something you know, like, strongman's kind of made me believe I'm more than just another number. You know, it's like being in that working uh, for someone else, you know, you're just a number to that company. But because of strongman, I'm I'm more than a number. I'm I'm Luke Stoltman, professional strongman, one of the strongest men in the world. So that's something that I can, you know, it's a legacy I'm trying to create for my family, and it's it is everything at the moment, and it's it's something that it's I've never thought possible. I mean, cut ten years ago when I, I started kind of doing it, started kind of, you know, getting into it. I didn't ever think that I'd have my own gym. I'd be competing all over the world with my brother, um, making money from it, being successful at it. I would never have thought that. I was just some, um, I was just some daft Highlander, you know, going to these competitions that like to have fun. But cut again ten years later. Who knows? This year, you know, it might be a one-two stoltman at the world's strongest man. That's the that's the goal. So, so yeah, you, you spoke about um, putting the stoltman name in the history. Mm. What's that? What does that mean to you? Like, is that, is that everything? Or? Yeah, man, I mean, geez, it's... Um, I remember my, my granddad, we called him Opa, he was Polish. He came across from Poland during the Second World War. And he, fucking hell, man, he was a worker. He used to work in the peat 
the peat fields, fencing, and such a hard worker. Um, and I think back to him, and I said again a few times, but there's a, a, a picture of Opa carrying this big tree trunk and just laughing, you know, it's like, that's what I envision us to be, you know, it's like, that photo was like, wow, that, that's mental, you know, to think that a grown man's lifting that tree. And now for, for Tom and I, you know, to be putting the Stoltman name in the history books, the first brothers in history to ever reach the world's strongest man final. So effectively, the strongest brothers that's ever lived is like, is so mind boggling. Uh, like, I can't even, I can't even put into words how it feels, but I'm so proud of our name and what it means, you know, it's, it's in, in Scandinavian it actually means proud man, Stoltman. So it's, I'm very proud to be a Stoltman. Um, and I want it to be, when people talk about it in years to come, like they mention Stoltman, you know, it's, it's strength, it just means strength. That's all I want it to be. Um, and good people, you know, it's, I, d I hope that we don't offend too many people. <laughs> um, but I want us to, you know, be remembered as being good people and kind of being, you know, that kind of people that maybe put the strength strength map or put Scotland back on that strength map. Because um, I think that's where Scotland deserves to be. Um, and hopefully there'll be a few little Stoltmans coming up the, the kind of family tree and we can get them into it and kind of keep that kind of strength kind of going with it. Yeah, because, um, I mean, world, around the world, when you think of Scotland there, like it, re it really is holiday, mm. all that kind of stuff. And I mean, we spoke about it earlier, so I kind of settled down a little bit. Now with you guys coming back up, when you grew up, was was it was it still known for being a strength country? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, there was all the Highland Games in the smaller towns still, but um, like when I was growing up, when I was younger, we had Highland Games here, and there was always the kind of local strongman show kind of weight over bar, tossing the hay bale, hay bale, welly boot, shot pat, hammer. You know, it was always that type of uh, aspect to it. Um, but nowadays it's kind of, it's dwindled off a little bit, which is a shame because it's so historic. The, the Highland Games is such a beautiful, historic um, sport. Um, that it deserves a lot more. So hopefully with Tom and I kind of being at the forefront of strength uh, in the world, I'd really like to help kind of recreate that kind of buzz that the Highland Games and maybe do some kind of crossover strength Highland Game kind of things, which would be awesome. Um, but it's, it's tough. I mean, it's, it just goes with the times. I mean, how many kids want to go out and throw a hammer nowadays? You know, it's a lot of Xbox kind of iPads and, you know, which is fine, you know, don't get me wrong, but I think we still need to have that... Um, strength at the forefront uh, as a man i mean you want to be strong you know you want to be able to kind of defend you know if anything happens if i'm out with my wife or if i'm out with my family or whatever and someone comes up i just want to be able to look at him and he knows that i could crush your skull you know what i mean i don't even want to have to like lay, lay a hand on him but i want to be able to have that presence and so nothing ever happens to any of my family because family for me is like number one like above everything, you know, it's, uh, if anyone insults my family, anyone insults my wife, you know, that's when we'll have problems. You know, that's kind of, for me, I think that's, that's a big no-no. But um, if we can install some strength back into the, the culture of Scotland, you know, we're not all Mars bar eating, you know, whiskey drinking kind of douchebags, but um, it's part of us, you know, we all like a whiskey and stuff, but let's just be strong whiskey drinkers rather than kind of weak floppy ones. Growing up with Tom, mm. um, obviously, I mean, we, we briefly touched about um, autism. I mean, I mean, insight from a family member would be really interesting. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Um, yeah, so, so growing up with Tom when he was younger, it was, um, it was a strange one because, like say, if mum went away shopping, Tom would just flip out and start crying and he wouldn't stop crying until mum came back. He wouldn't go anywhere by himself. Um, I remember it was a huge, a huge deal we made. Tom went, he got the train from Invergordon, 10 miles away to another train station, Fern, by himself. And that was like epic. That was like, wow, Tom, you're like, it's amazing. You know, and that was the first time he did anything like that. But 
Um, my mum, she was like, oh, it, it was unbelievable to see the patience she had and the, it was very hard to kind of get Tom almost diagnosed. It was, Tom had a way of like, when he went to these meetings with the, I don't know the right terminology, but the people that kind of dealt with additional needs and stuff like that. So mum and Tom would go along and then Tom would just be all well behaved and kind of, yes, 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 yes. Um, but then when he, when he went home, he would just tear the place to, to shreds. Um, but with, uh, we took Tom to the gym. This was a huge changing point for Tom. Um, so going to the gym when he was, I think it was 15, we started to take him to the gym, or I took him to the gym when I was at home from work. And yeah, kind of seen him kind of progress and stuff and, and, and mixing with other people as well. So there was a, a very good friend of ours, a, a boy, Matthew Forth, um, who I'm extremely good friends with, but Tom kind of had this bond with Matt. When I went away offshore, Matt would kind of take him under his wing, teach him the technique and stuff. And literally, Matt would say, and probably Tom will tell you, that the, <laughs> they'd come in, Tom would come in, Matt would say, hey, Tom. Matt, Tom would say, hi. And then they'd train, and then he'd say, bye. And it was like two words that Tom said the whole, the whole session. And this happened for a good couple of months. And then Tom felt comfortable. And then he started kind of coming out of his shell and just unbelievable, the, the, the change in, in a person. Like, from going from being completely head down, not speaking to anyone, to this like functioning member of society, whatever that is, you know, he was able to converse with people, speak to people, hold his head up and be that kind of proud man that he is, that we see today. So it was, it was extremely tough because um, a lot of, and rightly so, you know, a lot of mum's attention had to go on Tom to kind of, you know, deal with stuff that he was going through and school wasn't the best for him. And then mum would be worried, would he ever kind of hold down a job, have a wife, do all this stuff. And, and now, Jesus, man, you can't get him to shut up. He's just non-stop. He's flying all around the world. He's married. He's got a house. You know, Tom is one of the best guys you'll ever meet, you know, and he's got the heart, heart of, oh, oh, just the heart of gold, man. He's such a genuinely nice guy. And I think that's what people really kind of appreciate about Tom. Um, it's a shame we didn't have any clips of him when he was going mad when he was younger, because it's, uh, <laughs> that would have been a nice touch, but, uh, it was, I remember, like, I remember when he was younger, I used to, like, carry him and there was a, there was a parrot. And I used to have to pull the parrot and I used to be crying. As soon as I pulled the parrot, he'd stop crying. And then as soon as I stopped pulling the parrot, he'd start crying. So I had him on a arm and pulling the parrot down like this so the wings would flap. And then he'd be fine. You know, he'd have that kind of rocking back and forth and be, a t you know, his attention would be on the parrot. And then, yeah, so every time he kind of flipped out, I'd kind of do that with him, and um, but I dare say I couldn't pick him up like that now, so Jesus. Um, but it's funny, you know, to think like how far a person's come, and 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 really all that is is because of the gym. That's it. It's it's that simple. There's not. There wasn't any medication. Tom wasn't ever on any medication, any pills. You know, obviously there is a need for that, but. We need to try different things. We need to try alternative things, you know. Get into the gym, teach that routine. And for Tom, routine just came so easily. It was like, just water off a duck's back, man. It was just so amazing to see and see the confidence just grow. As Tom's strength grew, his confidence just grew. So it was, it was insane, man. It was such a, such a nice thing to see. And, and thankfully, Mum's, you know, still around to see her, him grow into this, you know, specimen of a man that he is now. So, so lucky to, for Tom, you know, so fortunate that the gym, I think the gym saved his life. You know, without that, I dread to think how, <sighs> what could have happened or what could have been of Tom. Um, but now, thankfully, he's just a beast of a man, man. He's just a... I know wherever mum is, she's looking down, man. It's just, 
she's beaming like from ear to ear, seeing what Tom has achieved. It's so good, so nice. It's uh, I mean, it's probably baffling for me in the world to, to even think yeah. like, what you're saying is just crazy. Yeah. Like you say, yeah, it's just like it's so strange to hear. Yeah. The strong man is like cut well, the gym is just taking in that. Yeah. Part. It's crazy. Um, something that really touched me yesterday is almost that time you said, if Mum could see what he's doing now. Oh man, it would be. You just, you, I don't, I think if mum came back for a day and she hadn't seen anything, you know, she was like completely oblivious to everything for the last four years and she came back, she wouldn't believe it. She wouldn't like, how are you my son? Like, when I, when I left, you were just a, you know, you're still quite shy, still quite kind of, maybe a bit scared at coming forward in the camera and stuff like that. But now, Jesus man, he's just, it's night and day. Absolutely night and day. So, yeah, mum would just be, oh, just so happy, so so happy, and and what Tom's achieved, and and I guess probably what I've, what we both have achieved. You know, it's um, we used to joke about it with, oh, you know, we're the strongest, we're the strongest brothers, and blah blah blah. And I used to say I was the strongest in the North Sea, off the oil rigs and stuff. And um, but now to be able to say it, and actually, it's true. It's just. She would be, oh, she would be so happy, man. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, hopefully, I, I don't know, whatever happens when you pass away, if you can, I don't know, I won't get into that, but I hope that there's some type of feeling that she can get, you know, still now. It'd be awesome. Yeah, strongest brothers to ever live, man. Yeah, like, literally. Uh, yeah, man, yeah. it's not bad. Really proud, man. <laughs> um, so, I want to wrap this up with uh, two, two uh, little things. Is um, One, what is your, um, for, people, for people who are watching, what mm. is your noble message? Those people who have made, I mean, look, where we are, mid, kind of middle of nowhere. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah, man, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Middle of nowhere, you've got, you've, you've done all this and you strongest brothers to ever live. Mm. What's your message to the people who feel that they've got an excuse or or even, even struggling to mm. sort of uh, push through. Yeah, so yeah. That was the noble message. What, what, what would you tell them? I think it's just, don't, don't um, make yourself fall short. You know, it's, it's so easy to, to accept that nothing is going to happen for you. You know, that you're just going to be another number. That's the easiest way. You know, get a job nine till five. And that's easy, you know. It's it's accept that something can happen, but you have to put the work in. It's just don't be scared of hard work, and you know, let the that fire that you've got in your belly, you know, translate into something good. You know, if you've got that passion and that drive, don't don't ever stop. You know, if you stop. I guarantee you, like, if you stop when you're 20, by the time you're 40, you're going to resent whatever that reason was you stopped. So say if you got married, your wife or your husband, whatever, isn't supportive, you're going to resent them in, in future life. So it's don't stop. It's just don't hold yourself accountable. You know, don't make these excuses. That's it. Hold yourself accountable. Don't make excuses and just have some pride in what you do. You know, I'm so proud what we've achieved. I can't even express how proud that I am. So just know that it's possible. Honestly, it's like, I could rant and rant, but it's like, <laughs> just believe in yourself. That's it, it's simple. Believe in yourself and take pride in what you do. Don't ever let anyone say that you can't do it because Tom and I are literally the living proof that you can achieve it. To be the strongest brothers that ever lived, if we said that 10, 15 years ago, people would laugh at me. I've said it to the promoters and stuff, Tom and I are going to be the strongest brothers that ever lived, and they laughed at me. Look at us now, that's it. Done. Um, just talking on, uh, you were just talking about choosing the hard route. Mm. Like what, like how, how can you convince somebody or yourself to, cho to choose the hard route? <sighs> because you've got to be a maniac. <laughs> no, I mean, if you want an easy life, then fine, man. It's, it's, it's not going to be rewarding. You know, doing something easy, you get little reward from it. Doing something hard and succeeding at it, 
doing a marathon, climbing Mount Everest, lifting 500 kilos, putting 230 kilos above your head. Those are extremely hard things to do, but the reward is never ending. You know, making that historic lift, the historic whatever it is, is never ending. You know, so for Tom and I, strongest brothers in history, first brothers in history to ever make the world's strongest man final, that's never ending. I can, I can boast about that forever. And that was hard to do. That was 99.99999% of people will never ever do that. And that's because too many people want the easy, easy stuff. And they're happy with that, that's fine. But know that the harder way is always a bigger rewards. So it's going to be great if we got to see the whole pack. Nothing, nothing truer has ever been said. That's, it's, it's simple, you know, go down that. If you've got a path, easy path, hard path, hard path every time, every time. Um, what, like, like, this is the last thing I'd like to end on, is uh, what is it for you and Tom going forward? What, what do you see? Like, what, what, what is your vision for the future? It's to progress and be the strongest, the top two strongest men in the world. That's it. It's, you know, we've already proved one thing. Now it's, let's prove that we are the strongest living people on this planet. That's, that's the end goal, man. That's, uh, without that, it doesn't, you know, being the strongest brothers, that's cool, you know, but let's not sell ourselves short. It's the two strongest men in the world and to be Highlanders from Scotland. That would be epic. <laughs> Sorry, just, just hearing you say it is crazy. Yeah. The strongest living man on earth. Yeah, it's wow. you, you too as well. Yeah. It's, just be crazy. it's it's insane, man. It's like, what more of a title do you want? Like, uh, <laughs> like someone could say, "Oh, I, I knew a guy that's strong." I went, oh, "Well, that's nice. I'm the strongest man in the world." And what? You know, it's like being able to say that you've done that feat that so many people would love to be able to say that, that they are the strongest man in the world. And for us to be able to say that we are the strongest brother ever lived and the two strongest men on the planet. That's it. Mic drop. Luke, thanks a lot, man. Thank you, man. really appreciate it. Yeah. Anything you Anything else you want to add at all? No, man, I'm, I'm happy. It yeah, was, uh, that, that was cool, man. Thank you yeah, so much. It was awesome. You,